Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Design Makeover, a show where you can watch Canva experts improve designs submitted by the community and learn some design tips and tricks along the way. My name is Leah and I'm from Canva Design School. For those of you watching the replay on YouTube, we've created a playlist with all the Design Makeover episodes. So you'll find the link in the description of the video. And if you would like to attend our future design makeovers live and get a chance to ask questions to our design experts, you can sign up to any of our live events via Design School Events, available at this link. Well, I would like to give a very warm welcome to our guest today, Nick. So I will let him introduce himself. Hi, thanks so much, Leah. I really appreciate the, uh, the introduction. And um, thank you all for having me. As Leah mentioned, um, I'm Nick and I've been at Canva for about two and a half years, uh, which is veteran status um, compared to a lot of people uh, given the growth that we've had recently. But yes, um, I work as a uh, education designer and I do a lot of uh, brand work with Canva as well. Um, my background, um, I actually worked at Apple for a few years, uh, about five years as a software trainer and then uh, left to pursue my love of design uh, and worked as a freelancer and also at a few different agencies for a number of years um, doing brand strategy and brand design here in Sydney and um, uh, for some clients abroad as well. Uh, and then of course I joined Canva as a brand designer, but um, with a special a specialization in education design. So I think this is the perfect role and combination of the three things I love, which is design, uh, education, and technology. So hopefully today I'll be able to share some of my learnings with Canva and design in terms of different principles and um, different things that um, I picked up along my journey. And of course, if you have any questions as I'm going through some designs today, you can put them in the chat and uh, we'll try and answer them throughout and um, possibly at the end as well. So that's a bit about me. Now a little bit about us uh, and Canva. I'm sure a lot of you are pretty familiar with our company right by now some of you might be quite new i think something we truly believe at canva is that design isn't just for designers it's for everyone you quite often hear us say that um we are all about empowering the whole world to design which really means design for everyone uh, and we're dedicated to bringing the power of visual communication to everyone so how do you get started with canva a lot of people get very overwhelmed in the beginning especially when it comes to learning about things like graphic design and design principles um, today, we're going to focus on lots of different design principles, uh, which I'll try and point out along the way. Just to kind of name a few here, this is what some design principles look like. So there's things like hierarchy, contrast, negative space, repetition, grouping, balance, and alignment. Um, so we're going to look at most of these today in a few different designs, and I'll try and point them out. And you can think of these a little bit like... Um, uh, they're kind of like design superpowers. Once you get a knack or get an eye for how to apply one of these principles, you'll start to see it everywhere. I don't know if, uh, if you're like me and you're walking down the street and you see a bus go past and you notice an ad on the side of the bus and you'll start to notice that the text isn't quite aligned to the left or the right or the, the colour harmony isn't quite right. It's, you know, the, the contrast isn't high enough or something like that. Um, it's kind of a superpower and kind of a curse as well because then you start to deconstruct everyone's designs when you're um, just out and about in the world. All right, so today we're going to be looking at two different designs that were submitted uh, on the Facebook group on Design Circle. Thanks, everyone, for sharing their designs, first of all. These two were, I think, the ones with the most potential that I thought were really quite interesting to begin with and ones that I thought I might be able to hopefully, um, you know, change and, and kind of progress to a, to a new kind of design with some design principles. All right, so let's jump into the first design, which is the business card. So this is from Juliana. Um, Juliana, are you, hopefully you're on the call today. Maybe you're not. Um, depends what time zone you're in, I suppose. Um, but if you are, feel free to jump in the chat and, and tell us a little bit about your, your business card design. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit about it. So uh, I'm going to jump over into the editor now so we can have a look at this design. All right, so here it is. I think Juliana has used a template here, but then she's customized this one with 
um, a few extra details. So there's obviously a couple of um, logos at the top here. Um, she's put in all of her details um, for her, um, I'm assuming her job position and the urban Ag agriculture division. Uh, and then there's also a QR code over here, which you can scan to get more information. And I did actually test it and it works. It takes you to a, a nice um, little link tree page where you can uh, get access to Juliana's other um, social media accounts and um, other links that she's put there. So overall, I think this design does work. It communicates exactly what she needs. And obviously you can imagine this uh, scale right down into the size of a business card. Um, it's something that she wants to hand over and, and get that kind of um, quick communication, uh, visual communication to the receiver of the card. Um, but I think there's a few little things here that we might be able to improve the communication even further. And I'm going to start with alignment, but even before I get to that point, I'm going to show you a few things that I normally do when I start working on a design, just as kind of like a best practice, I suppose. First thing we want to do is duplicate the design. So I don't want to touch Juliana's original design. We'll just um, keep this one there so we can compare it later on. And then what I like to do is turn on a few um, visual tools. Up here in the top left corner is the file menu. And you'll see you have um, something here called rulers. Um, I've already turned them on, but just so you can see if I turn them on and off, you press shift R on your keyboard to turn them on and off as well. It gives you these sort of um, uh, rulers at the top here, um, which give you the measurements of the dimensions of the actual canvas. Um, and it also allows you to use uh, guides as well. So you can see when I move the mouse onto that ruler, uh, I can actually drag down to create a guide. This is gonna be really helpful for aligning things on the page later on. So I'll just turn that off. Uh, the other one is margins. You turn your margins on. This creates um, kind of like a, a clear space around your design. So um, you can think of this as uh, kind of like a no-go zone um, just around the edge of your design, which helps keep everything in from the edge of the page so that, first of all, things just look a little bit neater and more, uh, um, more tidy. Uh, but second of all, they, when you go to print these cards, there's nothing sort of hanging off the edge of the page, no important information that's going to get cut off. Um, when, you, when you print business cards, obviously it needs to be cut down into a small size. Um, so I've turned on my margins, turned on the rulers, uh, so let's have a look at alignment, the first principle here. So you can see we've got a bunch of text over here. Um, there's good visual grouping going on at the moment. So we have uh, all the text is grouped together over in on the white area here on, on the card, um, but it's not really aligned. You can see the start of each line sort of starts at a different point each time. It's almost like it's center aligned, but even then it's still not center aligned either. So um, I'm actually going to align it all to the left here to this margin. So let's just pull in a guide and I'm going to put that onto this side margin just to make it really obvious where I'm trying to place my text. And let's start um, aligning some of this. So we can use the alignment button in the toolbar and snap that over to the left. It looks like there's an extra line in here. I'll just remove that one. Um, and we'll just kind of get going and see if I can rearrange this a little bit. It looks like there's an extra space at the beginning there as well. Get rid of that one. And this looks like it's okay. So that's in a separate text box. And then lastly, we'll move Juliana's name here as well. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. Our left alignment. And I think that's going to be a lot better in the final design. Um, the next thing that I think we should do is just consider um, a hierarchy. Uh, so hierarchy is really a, um, a really important principle that helps guide the viewer around your design. It helps them understand what is the most important thing on the page and what should they read first, and then what should they read second and third and fourth. At the moment, we have these logos up the top here, which uh, they're kind of the first thing you see because they're, um, you know, I think in left to right languages, we could quite often start in the top left corner and then sort of move through the design. So these are the first thing we see, which I'm not sure if that's really maybe the most important thing in the design. So I might consider moving these. Um, they're also on top of these kind of like um, graphic elements, these green gradient graphic elements, which um, I do quite like the repetition. So obviously this is repeated over here and here, which is really nice. 
But um, I'm wondering whether this sort of just distracts from the design a little bit. Um, you can see this logo here actually has a lot of green in it already, and it doesn't contrast very well off the green background. It's kind of a little hard to see, and also doesn't really fit within this shape. So I'm actually just going to, for simplicity, just delete them, get rid of that altogether. Um, I'm gonna make these a little smaller. Now, one issue here with making these smaller is that they're very hard to read already. Um, and they're obviously going to be even harder um, if I keep making them smaller. But, you know, I would, I would even suggest maybe using a simplified version of these logos, maybe one without the text, for example. But for now, we'll just, we'll make these a little smaller. And I'm actually going to rearrange them into a different position. I think these should actually be down the bottom rather than at the top. So let's create a bit better hierarchy by doing that. So we'll move that down. We'll bring this up. It goes up here. All right. So you can see everything is still within the sort of margin around the edge of the page. Um, but now we've got a bit better hierarchy. So the first thing we should be reading is Juliana's name. That's the most important thing on the page. And then her title uh, and then her additional information and then, of course, we have other things that um, maybe she's associated with these two um, organizations as well. So we have those links at the bottom. Um, so that's already looking a little bit better. I think the other thing that I really want to change here um, that I think would really help is the font pairing. So at the moment, we've got two different types of two different colors of our typography, but it's all in uh, aileron heavy. Let's have a look. It's all in aileron. So we've got aileron heavy for our title and then aileron regular for our subtitle and body. So I think we could do is look at trying to pair some fonts um, that really express Juliana's personality a little bit more. Obviously, we don't know each other, so it's a little hard for me to predict Juliana's personality, but I'm sure it's a lot more exciting than aileron. So um, we'll see if we can find something a little bit more exciting and with a little bit more personality for this um, headline. What I'm going to do at this point, I'm just going to share a couple of other slides before we go into fonts. I think uh, fonts are a really amazing and helpful principle to understand. Um, so let's just quickly jump over here. And I want to just talk very briefly about font categories for a moment. I'm sure many of you have heard of different types of fonts before. Um, there's three really important ones here on the page, which are serif, sans serif, and display. Does anyone know the difference between serif and sans serif? Yeah, put it in the chat, everyone. Does anyone know the difference? <laughs> well, um, the, the difference is actually right here on the screen. You can see um, there's clearly a difference between the way these two fonts are different. Uh, I mean, just to, just to point it out and make it really obvious, serif fonts have these little feet or tails on the edges of the letters, um, which kind of make them a little bit more decorative. Um, and they're very common in print media. Uh, sans serif don't have any of those little decorative tails. You can see here they're very kind of flat and clean. Um, and these are much more common in digital media. And then there's a third category here, which is called display. And these have the most personality of all. So these are fonts that are kind of weird and wacky and crazy. And, and you can see this one has like a drop shadow effect on it and it's sort of a, an inline as well as an outline. So um, there's, there's kind of uh, lots of different ways you can express a display font, but um, the best way to think about it is um, a lot of personality. So you want to use them in small doses. They're perfect for things like the name on a business card, right? Because that's the one part that should have a lot of personality, but all the information beneath that should maybe be in another font. Another question I wanted to ask you before we change the font here. Um, does anyone know how many fonts you should use in a design? Does anyone have an intuition there? Oh, this is a good question. Okay, so we are getting a couple twos, three, uh, yep. another two, two. Okay, so there seems to be a bit of a <laughs> bit of a consensus right on. on this one. Yeah, I think um, that's a that's a really good uh, guess there. Two to three is about right. I would normally say two um, is ideal. So um, coming back here to Juliana's card, I think we're probably going to be best served with two fonts. So one for the name and then a second one for the rest of the information. I think when you're designing, usually um, 
if, if you can try and stick with two, even uh, fonts that are within the same font family can work quite well. So maybe one that's bold and one that's regular. Um, so it's kind of like a thick and thin. I think something else to remember when you're pairing your fonts together is that opposites attract. Um, so it's a, it, just like that kind of thick and thin example, you might choose to use something like um, an expressive and a neutral font um, because they kind of, I guess, juxtapose off each other and, and they, they work, they end up working really well together. What you might find is if you use two fonts that are quite similar, they end up sort of competing or fighting on the page. And um, it's, it's sometimes a little hard to know why it's not working, but it could be just because you've picked two fonts that are very, very similar. So that's one example there, expressive, versus, uh, expressive and neutral works really nicely together. Um, so thick and thin is another way of, of doing that. Um, Serif and sans serif is a classic combination as well. So picking a font with a little decorative feet and one without um, always works really nicely. Uh, tall and short, another way to go. Um, so yeah, there's a whole bunch of different possibilities here. So let's come back to Juliana, Juliana's card. I am going to change her font now. I'm gonna jump in and show you how you can find all sorts of different um, display fonts. So up the top here in the toolbar, we can see Aileron Heavy is selected. So if we click on that font menu, what you'll find here, when before you even start searching, you, you can see these little um, kind of like little pill menus. So the little boxes with um, different descriptions written inside. So uh, we have handwriting, corporate, there's display, headings, paragraph, sans serif, serif. So there's all, all your different um, categories. So it makes it really easy for you to jump in and find fonts. So I'm gonna go with display. And um, this is actually uh, just a cool tip. You'll find a lot of Canva's brand new, funky, interesting, designy typefaces hidden away in display. Um, you know, for example, I really love Kelma. It's a really cool, interesting typeface. I don't think it might, it's gonna be right for this one, but um, there's lots of really, really interesting stuff in here. So, um, and you can see um, uh, display typefaces usually have a lot of personality. They're very interesting. Um, so I thought for this design, I would use um, Quando was the name of it. So let's see if I can find it here. Here it is. Yeah. And then the other thing I was going to do, um, you can see Juliana's name here is in all caps. It's all uppercase, which um, is a, a little bit shouty, maybe a little bit aggressive. I think it would probably look a little nicer if it was in lowercase. So um, let's drop that down. Um, I will make it title case, which just means the first letter of every word is capitalized. Uh, and I think that's starting to look a little bit better. All right, so we've got a bit better a typeface here. I'm just gonna make this a little bigger as well, actually, because it's the most important information. Yeah, so now we've got uh, a little bit better hierarchy going on. Everything's aligned a lot nicer. Um, there's a couple, couple more things I think we can do here. So this QR code down the bottom here, as you can see, it's kind of a red and blue color, which doesn't really match with the rest of the color palette on this business card. So I might also move it as well. You can see it's kind of tucked away in the bottom corner here, but it's, it's kind of awkwardly hanging off very close to the edge of the page. So what I might do is I'll move it first of all. I'll put it, I think I'll put it up here. Oop, taken both by accident. And I also make it a little bit smaller. Just nudge that in a little bit. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, and then possibly we can move uh, Juliana's photo down just a fraction. If I can select both, there we go. Okay. And so um, with this QR code, um, it's actually, it looks like it's an image. I think Juliana has taken this from another, uh, another location and sort of imported into Canva and, um, and just placed it inside. So I don't have the ability to change the colors here. You can see in the toolbar, there's no option for me to change the colors. Um, so really all I can do at this point, rather than um, you know, redesigning it, um, I could edit this image and maybe use a filter. And let's just change it to um, black and white. Maybe even, yeah, there we go. We'll leave it on street, which just makes it a little bit still black and white, but just with more con contrast. 
So that just removes the color from any image. Um, but in this case, um, that's a much better color and it works with all the other colors on the business card a little bit nicer. All right, so there's one other little, um, I guess, uh, extra tip that I wanted to share. Um, if you are interested in QR codes, um, they've certainly become popular in the last year and a half um, with everyone having to use them everywhere to sign in and, and just about everything. We actually have a, a QR app integrated into Canva. So if you go down to the more tab uh, in the sidebar here and then click on QR code, uh, you can actually um, type in your QR code here uh, and then hit generate code. Uh, and this will insert a code um, straight into your design, which you can move and place anywhere. So um, that's just a really cool um, little extra feature if you didn't know about that one. But um, I'm going to leave Juliana's um, code there. And I think that's pretty much done. So the last thing we need to do here is I'm just going to turn off my guides, turn off my margins, just so I can see everything clearly. The other thing that we need to do, remember, this is a business card. It's really small. So um, we should actually zoom it out to about the um, normal size. In fact, we can come in here and choose 100%. Um, you can see how small that is on my screen. Um, it's really important to check the legibility of all your text when you're designing really small things like a business card, because um, you can imagine if you, um, you know, made the text super small and then you went to print it and, you, and um, no one could read it, then that's going to be a huge issue. So having a look at this now, um, we might actually end up just increasing this font size a little bit, I think, maybe just to there. So it's going to be nice and easy to read. Uh, and I think that's pretty much, it's pretty much done. Um, so let's just zoom back out a touch here so we can see a little easier. So there's the, where we started and there's where we are now. Um, so I'm going to just flip over to the next slide over here. So you can see here what we've done, we've uh, essentially created uh, three three principles really. So we've um, worked with alignment to make everything aligned to the left and, and look a little bit neater. Um, we've also worked with hierarchy to essentially make sure the most imp important information is shown first. And then finally, we've also uh, worked with font pairing. So we've um, uh, used a display font for Juliana's uh, name to make it give it a little bit more personality and kind of get, give you some sense of what she's all about. Um, now, I hope um, Juliana can take this design even further and maybe um, change that font to something that, that really um, uh, represents her personality. Um, that would be even better. Uh, but I think that's a really good start for now. All right, so let's go on to the next example. So this one is by uh, Jonatas, and it is a logo for, uh, I can only assume, is maybe an online shopping brand. Um, maybe it's a shopping brand in, in real life, but you've got a shopping cart there and, um, and the word worry. Uh, I don't know if uh, Jonatas is on the call today, but um, if you are, please feel free to jump in the chat and um, let us know um, a little bit about your logo. I'd love to hear uh, what it's for, um, how you came up with the idea, um, you know, anything like that it would be really helpful. It's a very interesting and, and it's a very, really cool design, actually. I really like it already. So I didn't want to change it up too much, but yeah, I've got a few little things that maybe we can try on this one to get some other variation. All right, so I'll come back over to uh, Jonatas's design. So here is the original logo. So once again, I'm going to come down and duplicate this page. And in this case, I don't necessarily need to use guides as much because I'm just creating a kind of like a logo mock-up, if you like, that is going to be used in a design later on. So not, not as important to have, um, you know, I guess, uh, rulers and guides on for this one. But yeah, I want to look at a few different things here. So um, we want to look at a clear space. We want to look at fonts again, and we want to look at color harmonies and some color basics. So um, let's try the first thing here, which we already, we already learned a little bit about fonts. So I'm actually going to start with that um, here again. And let's have a look in our uh, font drawer. And I'm going to use another display font. Um, so let me come over to display. And um, one moment. 
to make sure I'm on the right page here. Yeah, here we go. So there was one here that I really loved um, that I thought really spoke to this design. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, I think I'll search for it. It's uh, Tan Nimbus. Yeah, this one here. Now this looks a little bit um, different to what Jonatas originally had, but what I loved about this type here, and this is something that I guess you uh, pick up with a lot of time working with type, but you look for different shapes that sort of complement um, other parts of the design. So what, what I really loved about this design was this shopping trolley kind of has these really pointy shapes that are pointing to the left. Um, they're kind of like really fast looking kind of serifs that point off to the left. And um, I thought, why don't we try and find a font that also has that kind of nice serifs that also sort of point to the left and give you that kind of feeling of speed almost. Um, so this one, I, I feel kind of matches, especially this part of the W here kind of really does feel like it matches in with the trolley design here. And you can see John Tass has also used very cleverly uh, the wheels of the trolley and turned it into like a little face, which is very cute. And I love faces in logo design. I don't know why, um, I'm a big sucker for putting, I guess, uh, a human element into a logo. It really does uh, humanize a brand and helps people associate and identify brands um, when you use things like faces, you know, whether eyes or a mouth or something like that. So I do really love this and I, I definitely want to work with that. Something else I noticed about this design, which I thought was very clever, I'm just going to zoom right in here. See these little semicircle shapes here? Well, they're not quite what you think. Um, John Tass has quite cleverly used um, our infographic charts feature to create semicircles. Um, so to give you an idea of how he's actually done this, I'm going to show you um, what I think he did here. So um, if we come into the elements area, uh, and then we have an area called charts here. So I'm going to choose C all. And you can see we've got all these kind of funky looking stat charts. Um, I'm going to grab this one here, which is uh, it's a radial progress chart. So you can see here, see here when I move that, it kind of goes up and down. And then um, it looks like I think what Jonatas has done here is just change the color like that and then use that as a little semicircle element like that. And, you know, I think this is what's awesome about Canva is you can really... I don't know, you can, kind of, you can kind of hack Canva and use it the way you want. You don't always have to use elements for what they're designed for. Like, however you can achieve your design using whatever elements are available, like that's totally fine. You don't have to use things the way they're intended to. You know, the, uh, the whole platform is just there for you to, to fill, facilitate your creativity and, and use however you want. So I actually really love that he's done that. One thing I thought would uh, look quite nice for um, fixing up uh, the kind of smiley face area here is uh, when we when we edit to these radial progress charts here, we have an option to use rounded endpoints, which I thought um, look a little nicer. You can see here these sharp edge ends to the um, to the radial progress chart don't quite match up with the sort of rounded endpoints that we have everywhere else. So I thought maybe we can make it a little bit more friendly by um, creating rounded endpoints. So let me delete this and I will put in rounded endpoints on these, and a rounded endpoint here and on this one. Okay, really good. All right. So before we take this any further, um, I just wanted to talk a bit about the color. So um, Jonatas has chosen purple as a background and then we've got yellow and this sort of lighter purple here for the other half of the trolley. Now, one thing that's really important to consider with color is the contrast. So you can see here this uh, lighter purple on the dark purple background isn't necessarily very high contrast. It, can, it might be a little difficult to see um, because the, the two colors are a little bit too close. So um, I think what we should be doing is, is considering uh, making our colors much higher contrast by having a dark background and light colors, but also consider other use cases. Whenever you're designing logos, what a lot of brands need to think about is where is their logo going to end up? Is it going to be on uh, the side of a billboard? Is it going to be on packaging? Is it going to be on a business card or, you know, 
on the side of a plane. You know, it could be it could be anywhere. And and sometimes we don't know what color background um, it's going to be on. We don't get to choose the color of the background all the time as well. So will this logo work on a light background, white? Will it work on a black background? Will it work on purple? We need to think about all those different variations. We also need to think about um, the size and scale of the logo. So at the moment, this logo is quite tall. Um, you can see here, it's actually slightly taller than it is wide, um, but that might not work for some um, uh, use cases. Maybe we need to have a much wider kind of compressed version that, that will work, uh, where maybe we put the shopping cart down on the side like this. Um, so uh, I thought about that and I think we will try a couple of different options here for color and for logo lockup. Uh, so once again, before we get into that, I just wanted to run through some um, nice design principle slides that um, uh, I had here, which I think are really, really, um, really handy. Um, so a lot of you have probably seen the color wheel before. It's uh, something we see in about second grade most of the time. Um, but just to kind of give you a bit of a refresher here. Um, so the color wheel is made up of 12 colors and you have primary colors, which mix into second, secondary colors. Um, and then they mix into tertiary colors and they make up the 12 colors on the wheel here. And you can see also, if we were to run a line down the, the color wheel sort of diagonally like that, um, all the colors on this side over here are all very warm colors. Um, so we call this kind of the warm side and then every, every color on this side is kind of the cool colors. So um, they're very contrasting and that's kind of how we think about this kind of simplified color spectrum device here. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated from here. Um, so there are some really helpful color harmonies. And if you're interested in sort of like the science behind the color and how it works, um, these are really great to, to study. And um, these are kind of like classifications or groupings of color that are um, scientifically kind of proven to work quite well together. So complementary simply means two colors that are on opposite sides of the color wheel. Um, so you can see that's an example of what a palette made of complementary colors might look like. Monochromatic is one of my favorites. So this is when you take a single color and you add varying degrees of tint or shade to that color. So you make it lighter or darker. And you can end up with quite a diverse palette just using um, a single monochromatic color palette. Analogous, uh, this is essentially three or more colors that are, are close together on the um, spectrum. So they're all sitting next to each other on the wheel. Um, so this is an example of an analogous palette there. Uh, and then triadic is uh, three points at equal spacing um, around the wheel. Um, so there's an example of a triadic palette, which can be really interesting as well, really nice. Um, there's even more, there's, there's tetradic palettes and then there's ways you can combine these together to get even more crazy palettes. But this is just kind of like a nice introduction to some of the most basic color harmonies that are out there. Something else to consider um, while we're working on uh, Jonatas's design, um, I started talking about contrast before and light versus dark colors. I don't know if anyone's having any trouble reading this slide over here. Um, it's a little hard for me to read, and that's because the two colors here, the red and blue, even though they are complementary, they're on opposite sides of the color wheel, they're both too bright. Um, then they, we actually need a bit more contrast by having one dark and one light, um, like this example on the right here. It's much easier to read. Another thing about color is, um, I, I think, uh, probably the most important um, aspect of color is the subtext or the emotion behind it. And this definitely varies from different cultures around the world. So, you know, for example, in Western cultures, quite often red and yellow are associated with hunger and passion and excitement, positivity, um, things like that, um, which is uh, quite common. You see a lot of fast food brands. Um, there's one in particular that comes to mind that uses red and yellow. But, you know, it's all about, um, you know, positivity, happiness, hunger, all those sorts of things. And likewise, when you, you look at blue, especially in a lot of Western cultures, you see a lot of banks and insurance companies and professional services. They all want to be blue because it's secure and dependable. White is also associated with sterility and cleanliness. So you see a lot of pharmaceutical companies and cosmetic brands all using white. Um, so there's definitely a clear link between emotion and uh, I guess cultural uh, interpretation of color, which is really important to consider, um, especially if you're creating something like a logo. 
So I don't know too much about uh, Jonatas's logo here, but we're going we're gonna to stick with the yellow color. Uh, we're really just going to focus on contrast for this one. So um, the first thing I want to do is deal with this low contrast half of the trolley. Um, so I'm just going to change that color. Um, we'll make it maybe more of a brighter red color. And I think this has a transparency on it. So I'll just turn that up. So that's already a lot higher contrast now. But once again, um, there might be a, a really clear rationale for Jonatas using these colors, which I'd love to learn about, but I'm sure um, he'll be able to update us in the, in the chat if he's, if he's listening in. Okay, so that's um, the color dealt with. I'm just gonna update the rest of this little face here. Um, what I was doing before, I've updated these little, little smiley to be rounded. Um, the other thing I'm gonna do is just to kind of remove some of the detail here, I think um, when you're designing logos, it's really important to have logos that don't have, they're kind of graphically reduced, right? You want, you want them to not have too much detail, just enough detail so that they, um, so that people get that it's a face, but maybe not more than that. So I'm gonna try doing a kind of a simplified version of the eyes slash wheels, where we maybe use this, Again. And I'm going to copy this part, change the color. Um, so it's purple. Bring it forward. Um, rotate that around. And then I'm just going to copy this one over here. Uh, it's sitting behind. So I'm just using my position to bring that forward. Um, if you're wondering if that ever happens to you and you have an element and it's stuck behind another one, um, you can see here, this one here, it's just dis disappeared on me. Um, you can actually just use position and then forwards. That will actually bring your elements forward, further forward in the stack um, if you've got things layered on top of each other. All right, so I think that's maybe a bit more of a simplified version of a face. Um, it's looking pretty cool. Um, the other thing I thought as well is we've got this, um, it's, you know, we're trying to graphically reduce this logo to make it as simple as possible so that it'll work when it's really small or really big. Um, we've got a lot of circles going on here already. And um, the I on worry, um, the letter I here has a big circle in it, which um, I don't think we really need. Um, it's going back to the original here. I know Jonatas has it in here as well, but it's kind of an extra element that maybe we don't need. So I'm actually just going to cover it up. I'm going to grab a square and I'm just going to essentially cover it with this square. So let's go down to here and then bring that forward. I'm just going to make that same color as the background to effectively delete that circle. All right, let me zoom back out a little bit. All right, and maybe just nudge this up a little bit. So that's kind of uh, what I've done for the, the, the main logo there. I think that um, um, that kind of, uh, to me, communicates a little bit more personality. It's a little bit more simplified. The color is a little better, um, but there's still a few more considerations here that I, I think we need to make. And uh, I'm just gonna skip forward a couple of slides because here's one I prepared earlier. Like a magician, I'll pull another one out of uh, my hat here. Um, so I've actually created um, another version. So here's, here's the, uh, the full version. I've created another lockup. Um, so a lockup is essentially something designers, uh, it's a term designers use to talk about how you arrange certain graphic elements together on the page, um, especially when we're talking about things like logos. Um, so a lockup allows you a bit more flexibility um, for maybe um, if you were using a, maybe a business card or maybe even a, um, the bottom of a poster, maybe this was going in a magazine somewhere. Something like this, this horizontal lockup would be um, a lot better in some instances than the vertical lockup. So um, it's quite good to have the flexibility and the, the option to have both. So you can see here, I've just arranged the trolley element to sort of be the same height as the letters. And it kind of fits in quite nicely as a little horizontal lockup. Uh, and then the last part here, um, I was talking about uh, at the beginning, uh, how does the logo work on white backgrounds? How does it work on dark backgrounds? We need to test all of this. 
Uh, with logos, it's really important to have lots of flexibility and to test, test, test. So, you know, try uh, making it really small and printing it out. Um, try printing it out really big and sticking it on your wall for a while and see, um, see how it looks. So really important to get um, a lot of feedback and do a lot of testing with logos. So I've just converted all of the colors here to black and stuck it onto a white background. Uh, and then what we can do here is we can zoom right out as far as we can uh, to kind of see how small it can go before we can't read it anymore. So for me, uh, I'm not sure how you're seeing this in your screen, but when I get to about there, I can't really make out the words anymore. Um, so, you know, we might want to consider, how, you know, how small does this need to be? Does it need to be an app icon? You know, if it's going on a phone, for example, uh, then sometimes you might even just use just the, the word W. Maybe, um, maybe that's uh, another way to go. You know, we get rid of all of the other letters and just have that as an icon, which might, might be on our app, something like that. So uh, then I've also done the same thing again here with um, the black onto, uh, onto a black background. So white on black. Um, so once again, you can zoom in and out and get a feel for how um, big or small that's working. And you can see here, I'm starting to build um, a kind of a toolkit of logos. So I've got my full color version. Um, I've got my black on white version and my white on black version. And I've got two lockups of each, uh, a, a stacked vertical version and a horizontal version. Um, so that's already giving you lots of flexibility depending where you want to use that later on. All right, how's everyone going? Is that um, is that helpful so far? Is it overwhelming? There's been lots of love in the chat, Nick. So thank you so much for sharing all this Canva goodness. Excellent. Well, that's the end of uh, the second design. So um, again, there's a little quick before and after. I hope, Jonatas, um, I didn't, I did, uh, I did faithfully to your design and didn't um, take over it too much. Um, hopefully, you love it. But of course, if you want to tweak it even more, you know, we'd love to see what you come up with. So. Um, that's pretty much it for today. I might throw over to Leah so um, we can answer any questions you might have. I also just thought I would mention for everyone, um, Nick was talking about colour theory and stuff quite a bit, but we also have a great resource, uh, canva.com forward slash colours, which I'll also just post the website in the chat for everyone now. And I've found that, oh, there we go. It's on the screen. Perfect. The, uh, Here's one I prepared earlier. Yes, no, I, I absolutely was intending to show you this page. Um, if you head over to canva.com slash C-O-L-O-R-S, so colors spelt the American way, um, you'll find this page here, which is an amazing resource for learning about color uh, palettes, creating your own color palettes, and just kind of learning about, I guess, some of the science behind um, different color meanings. Um, so just to give you an example, um, I talk a little bit about some of the different color harmonies like complementary, analogous, triadic and, and so forth. This is a way for you to play with some of those. So you can see here, um, I've actually selected to complementary um, at the moment, but maybe I'll go for a triadic one. And um, what that actually does it allows me to select one point on the color wheel. And as I move that point around, it automatically selects the second and third point for me based on the triadic combination which is really cool, right? Uh, you can also add more um, tint to the color here. And then of course you can copy, um, you can copy these swatches using the hex code down here. So this is a hexadecimal code, um, which you can essentially click on and bring that over into your design. And you can paste that straight in. There it is, which doesn't work at all with that background. So let me undo that one. And the other part here I wanted to quickly show you, we also have the uh, color meanings area. I think this is one of my favorite um, areas. Our, our, um, our designers have spent a lot of time collecting and writing all the information on this page. So if you're interested in learning um, all there is to know about bright orange, um, if you click on it, um, you can see here, there's a little bit of a uh, history of bright orange. Um, how uh, what what it's what rep what's represented by orange uh, in different uh, kind of uh, emotions and feelings? Um, how you can pair it? How you can use it? Um, there's also color space conversions, um, which is a little bit more technical, but um, there's a lot of information there about every single color that you can use in Canva. So that's pretty cool.
Definitely. I've had so much fun playing around with all the different color pairings and stuff on there. So go check it out if you haven't already. Uh, we have actually got a couple questions that have just come in, Nick. Um, Joanna was wondering if we are able to edit the co uh, the colors on QR codes in Canva. Good question. Um, I think the answer is no at the moment, unfortunately. Um, I was just playing around with it before um, we jumped on just to see, I guess, what we can do. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure at the moment we only have the ability to add black and white codes. Um, so let's just try this example here again. If I add this one in, um, it's essentially an image which is not editable. Um, oh, hang on. Yes, it is. I take back everything I just said. <laughs> so it looks like we can change the background um, color. Perhaps that's the only part, but you know, you can get pretty creative. Um, I mean, I'm just spitballing here, but um, if I change this back to white and maybe choose edit image, um, you can use um, some of our image editing apps to do things like add a duotone, um, you know, it's like color mix rainbow kind of filters. There's all sorts of interesting stuff here. Um, perhaps duotone could be the way to go. Then we can get an interesting looking color. Now it looks like we can edit the colors this way. So um, there's a creative way to change the colors, I guess kind of in a roundabout way, the duotone effect. I didn't even know that. So there you go. <laughs> Very cool. We also have another question and this person was just wondering if you're able to group elements in your design. Yeah, absolutely. It's a really good question. Um, it's really important to group information that belongs together into their own sort of groups. It really helps with, I guess, uh, working with your design and rearranging things, especially once you've got everything kind of locked in, but you still might need to move your, your visual groups around. Um, so for example, here, you can see I have two text boxes here, um, which are separate. Um, I actually would prefer to group these together so that um, I can manipulate them together. So I'm going to draw, a, draw a, a box around both of my objects like that uh, and then choose group up here. Uh, and that means now uh, when I move one, they both move together. Um, so that's really, really handy. Um, and also the same thing for the bottom here. These two logos aren't grouped together. So I might just draw a box around both of them and then choose group. Um, and it's the same to ungroup them again. So um, just select and then click ungroup. Yeah, that's that's grouping, really, really easy. Perfect, thank you, Nick. Well, I think that wraps up our show for today. I would also like to mention that we have a Canva Design Circle Facebook group, and this is actually where we got our submissions for the design makeover today. And I think we've got about 170,000 members now, so it's a great place to ask questions hear about new feature rollouts and get tips and tricks as well as feedback on your designs. So thank you very much for attending Design Makeover today. I hope you learned something and make sure to stay tuned for future episodes with our extremely talented design team here at Canva. Make sure to follow Canva on our social channels for everything you need to know about design. Thanks everybody. Thanks for listening. Bye.